Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Able to Learn Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene couldn't be here today. However, before we begin um, our uh, discussion with Green Mountain Support Services, let us thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and many others, including the partnership with um, the Association for the Blind of Vermont, the Division for the Blind of Vermont, and many, many, many others. We would like to uh, thank Joshua Smith, Executive Director of Green Mountain Support Services, for joining us on Able Den on Air. Yeah, Lawrence, thank you for having me come back. I'm really excited. We haven't been able to talk at all for, you know, haven't been in the... Um, doing a Zoom show is doing not Zoom easy. shows are kind of different, exactly. Um, but I am excited to be back here and talk about some of the, the, the big projects that Green Mountain Support Services has been doing. So the before last we years. begin um, on the new projects on Green Mountain Support Services, for those that don't know about uh, Green Mountain Support Services, why don't you tell them a little bit about uh, your agency and what you guys do? So Green Mountain Support Services, we are a specialty service agency. We work with people living with disabilities, whether they be dis disabilities based off of um, intellectual disabilities, um, brain injuries, or disabilities based off of the benefits of age. And the reason why I say the benefits of age is because uh, those that uh, my, a mentor of mine once said uh, that uh, disability is a natural part of the human experience. Um, and he said, my hope to you is that you live long enough to experience your own disabilities. Because not everybody gets to live long enough to experience disabilities. Um, and so, as we say, that is a natural part. Disability is a natural part of the human experience. And what we do is we make sure that we provide advocacy and support for people living with disabilities to make sure that they are being able to access the community of their choosing. And a good point about this is like a, a few years ago, our mission statement for our organization was ensuring that our neighbors with disabilities are at home in the community. We tweaked it. We actually changed it to say um, ensuring that our neighbors with disability, disabilities are at home in their community. Because community isn't a location. Community is the group of people that you want to work with, the group of people that you want to be a part of. 
Um, we all have different communities. Um, it could be a church community. It could be a fishing community. Um, it could be um, you know, a community of the Rotary Club or a, a bookstore or a book club. Whatever it is, we get to choose our own community. And it shouldn't matter whether or not if you have a disability or not that you should still have access to the community that you choose to belong to. And it shouldn't be forced upon you based off of financial reasons. It shouldn't be forced upon you based off of um, guardians who pressure you into going to certain places. So that's really what we stand for. And the benefit that we have at Green Mountain Support Services is that we, we work almost statewide. We work out of 12 out of 14 counties right now. Um, what does that mean, 12 to 14 counties? So there's 14 counties in Vermont, um, and we work out of 12 out of those 14 counties. Us as a specialty service agency, you'll see Northeast Kingdom Human Services only works in the Northeast Kingdom. Washington County Mental Health only works in Washington County. Howard Center only works in Chittenden County. Um, a lot of Rutland County Mental Health only works in Rutland County. We have the ability, based off of our statute and designation, that we're able to work um, statewide. Mm -hmm. So that gives us and that gives people living with disabilities a freedom of choice, whether they working living with a brain injury, um, having an intellectual disability, or um, or or as I say, having a disability based off of the benefits of age, that they're able to choose what services they would like to get from. And one of the benefits is us is as a specialty service agency is that we are able to give people that choice. Uh, so that's well, basically what we do as Green Mountain Support Services. We provide advocacy work and we provide uh, choice and uh, we provide community-based supports for all Vermonters who are living with a disability. Mm. Um, so let's uh, talk about um, I looked on your website, and you have lots and lots of services. One of the things I would like to um, talk about um, is supportive employment. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that your agency doesn't believe in uh, congregate care, but in a sense, uh, what does your agency do about supportive employment and supporting people with special needs in employment? So basically what that enti entails is that what we do is that we work with some direct support professionals who specialize in supported employment. And what that is is to allow, to give uh, people living with a, with a disability some um, access and assistance in making sure that they, they're successful. And you're right. See, the, the benefit, I would say that the challenge of congregate settings and segregated settings, it creates a culture of them instead of a culture of we. Any time that you eliminate a portion of the population um, by, uh, with, without their consent, in the sense, away from, uh, away from, the, uh, away from the larger uh, community settings, what you do is uh, you do create this culture of a them instead of a culture of a we. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's important what for us. exactly between we and them? Well, per first of all, like, the point of it like being with a we is that we are all together. But if you start, if you start basing it like a segregated or institutionalizations, um, or or congregate or segregated settings, you do create this culture of that is where that group of people live. That's where that group of people live. Um, the difference is, is that when I get back to what I said earlier, is people should always get to choose their community, and if they choose to be part of a segregated community, whether it be out on a farm someplace, or if you're looking at um, a group of people that have um, specific values um, and beliefs, that they have, they have the capacity and the decision and the informed decision to be in a congregate setting based off of the people that they feel most, most comfortable with. But the difference is, in a segregated setting and in an institutional setting, the folks that are in there it's really important to make sure that they have that choice. Mm -hmm. If they choose to do that, you know what? That's what we get back. We will. We we make sure that we help support that because our job is to let people be a part of their own community, mm -hmm. the community they choose to be a part of. Um, so when you talk about the the supported employment program, is that um, that 
being a part of being a part of um, a working environment where you're among your peers of the people that that also are in that same working environment, whether it be working at a Maplefields, um, working at um, you know working at a Dunkin' Donuts, or working at a library, or working at um, or, or working in a um, in a school system or a school a school situation. The point is, is that you still get to choose. That you, this is the community you want to be or a part of. Or if someone of. from, if if a participant in your agency wants to say, uh, "Oh, uh, I would like to work in a TV station. Let's find you someone to pair you up with." Yeah. Yeah. You know, yep, exactly. That, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, before we get to your new projects, staffing all across the board globally has been a problem. Uh, direct support professionals and their their um, their wages. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, uh, not too uh, uh, not too much in the past. There was a uh, uh, um, I think about two years ago before the pandemic, there was a, a documentary called Invaluable. Yeah. How valuable is the DSP workforce, and what? What is your main uh, focus on um, higher wages for the DSP um, uh, staff? So there's a really good point is that I'm, I'm working with the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals to, to work on um, working on creating a federal standard occupational classification for direct support professionals. There is no standard occupational classification. What that means is like if you go to the, the, the federal um, Department of Labor, they have, a list, they have a listing of what a plumber is, what an electrician is, what a nurse is, what a teacher is, what, uh, you know, what a, um, they, they have a list of things, but they do not have a standard occupational classification for a direct support professional, which is something that is, so what states do is they find the cheapest level of what that would be, whether it would be a, an LNA or a, a custodian or a, um, whatever they, they find whatever the lowest level is, and then they then they equate that to how much they want to pay a direct support professional. But as anybody knows in this work, a direct support professional is everything. They are a coach. They are a job coach. They are um, a personal care attendant. They're an LNA. Um, they do medical administration. Um, they do a lot of advocacy work. They do a lot of What driving. about medication? They do a lot of medication administration. They do so many things. No other position is so involved in that because it involves somebody working not only in a residential setting, but also in a community-based setting and also in a job setting. Um, and you're also working to make sure people are able to make good decisions. So there's a lot of advocacy and coaching involved in a lot of that stuff. So there is no standard occupational classification for a direct support professional. So with that said, it actually is, it, it behooves us as a society to make sure that we actually enforce that by actually having that standard occupational classification to say, we are looking at the people who provide provide very direct and intimate support for our most vulnerable population. And how are you expecting us to, to do that if there is no legally recognized job description that, that involves that? So, so as you brought up the point of pay, is pay is very important, uh, but it's, it's also a reflection of the values given to that. So why is a doctor paid more? Why is a lawyer paid more? Why is a teacher paid less? Why is a nurse paid less? And it's based off of what we feel is the value in our society of someone's position. So when you increase somebody's salary, you're basically giving a monetary value to say, we value the work you do, and we value, and you need to be, you need to be respected in the work you do. And that comes down to that monetary piece. But a lot of it comes down to also, as we say, is... Um, um, the dignity and respect of that position is when you provide a level of dignity re and respect to somebody's position by actually having a standard occupational code and a standard occupational classification, and you also are able to say, you know what, um, the work you do is valuable, and we recognize that, and uh, we also truly believe that you should not be paid below minimum wage. And here's the point, too, spe specifically here in Vermont, 
the 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 poverty the poverty rate if you're if you're a single person living by yourself in Vermont you have to make a minimum of twenty one dollars an hour in order to survive living in Vermont not having money this is just the amount of money because of the cost of living has increased so much and the state of Vermont has now says that they're going to be paying direct support professionals sixteen dollars an hour so basically the state of Vermont is telling the people who provide support for the most vulnerable population of our state to say, you deserve to get paid below poverty level wages to support our most vulnerable population. So why is it $21? Is there a reason for that? It's based off of how much things cost. So it's the cost of living. So how much groceries cost here? How much rent costs? How much gas costs? Uh, and many of you know here in Vermont, if you don't have a car, it is hard to get around. So the fact that you need a car, you need a place to live. Everything has gone up in price in Vermont. So ba basically what we're saying is that in order for you to barely, barely survive if you're living by yourself is $21 an hour. And if you're married, it's double if It's that. more. It's exactly, it's more. So keep in mind too, if you're married and, and, then, you're, and then your partner's bringing in money, that will increase it. But if you are a single parent with a kid or two kids, you're only that single income. So if you're actually a single income person living in there and you have kids, child care, all that stuff, you cannot survive on $21 an hour. And the fact that the state of Vermont says we're paying DSPs because the state of Vermont gets to decide that. They say that we're paying direct support professionals $17, $16 an hour um, is basically an affront to uh, our most vulnerable population. Okay. Um, so let's uh, talk about um, some of the new projects that Green Mountain Support Services is doing. Yeah. Um, so one thing is that we were able to uh, partner with the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, our, our, values, our, our, our values and mission and values are very much aligned, so we were able to, during the pandemic, um, is um, reach out to the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont to partner with them um, with our projects and our programs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been amazing being able to sit down and work with them on a lot of their, um, a lot of their projects with um, supporting people, supporting brain injury survivors. The caveat to a brain injury survivors are that it's, it's not an intellectual disability. Mm. It's not age related. Uh, it is, um, and, it, and, and nobody ever plans on getting a brain injury. So the, the difference and the reason why the Brain Injury Alliance is so, so important in Vermont, mm -hmm. um, people living with an intellectual disability have an intellectual disability, so they are, um, there's research and, 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 and work done to kind of determine and, and know ahead of time um, the, the support and services that are available. Same thing for somebody with age-related um, age disabilities. Yeah, how, you see how, that how does, um, sorry to piggyback, yeah. but how does, uh, as a person gets older, yeah. uh, for example, I'm turning 50 next year, yeah. but as a person with a disability gets older, yeah. what services do you provide for the older population? Varies the same thing as we do with intellectual disabilities. We provide advocacy work and we provide community-based services and residential services. So if somebody wants to live in place, if somebody is looking to be a part of a shared living model, or if somebody is looking to be able to uh, get shopping done. These are the things that that uh, the Green Mountain Support Services um, is what we're uh, is 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 the type of work that we do. Mm -hmm. So um, now the pandemic, yeah, um, which we're still partly in. Uh, how has Green Mountain Support Services helped people with special needs during the pandemic? So we made sure, I was really, I'm very proud of the fact that, and very grateful for the fact that Greenmount Support Services um, was not negatively affected by any um, turnover. Um, what do you mean stayed, by turnover? People stayed. People stayed and worked, the people stayed and worked with us. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have anybody quit, for instance. So we were very, and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that we truly work with our staff to make sure we say, you know what, you're adults, you're able to make adult decisions, and we want to treat you like adults. So, you know, with our unlimited vacation policy, our six weeks of paid time off every, every year for our, our hourly staff, um, having the, one of the most robust 
health insurance plans in the state. Some of these things, and already having allowing people to work from work remotely, are all things that were able to put us in a pretty because, good standing. Uh, because a lot of a lot of services for people with special needs either closed or were put on hold during the pandemic. So, how did you guys really? So it was ba right. So it was based off of the same thing for everybody. We all had to stay home. We all had to um, work separately. So what we did is that we. We made sure the people we provide services for had the same access in the same in, in the same access and the same ability as everybody else in Vermont is that you had to work remote. Were you safe? You had to work remotely. You had to be home. Um, what we did is we did a lot of deliveries for people. We made sure that people stayed connected. We had Zoom game, Zoom meetings. We had Zoom um, uh, interactions with playing bingo and all these other things. That uh, you to had a Zoom conference too. Zoom conferences, exactly. Yeah, with our um, with our cerebral palsy conference we did for two years during the pandemic. So all of these things we were able to do to make sure that people still, the point of it, and this is what I love about this, um, Lawrence, is that it's a really good quote from, I see, I believe, uh, Dave Petoniak, who is a, who's a very, very well-known, uh, a very well-known advocate for people living with disabilities. And he said, loneliness is the only disability. So the fact is, is like recognizing, the, making sure that we are recognizing to make sure that people are not alone during that was paramount to the types of services that we provided, is that we made sure that, that the people we provided services for were connected to the communities of, the, the communities of their choosing. Um, what are the, mis uh, uh, in your opinion, uh, what, are some, what are some misconceptions around people with special needs that when people first meet them or something like that? Uh, I don't know. Um, so not, 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 not living presently with a disability, it's hard to determine what that is. But I do know, like looking from an advocacy perspective, is that we, we don't work with diagnoses, we work with people. And we, made sure that, and we make sure that we work with, the, with people to say, what communities do you want to be a part of? Where do you want it? Where do you see yourself, where do you see yourself in 20 years? You know, it's all about you know, helping them with planning just like and we would do with anybody else um, that anybody else that are that um, might be wanting to try to find and form their own communities. Um, in terms of you know, uh, let's get back to some congregate uh, congregate question for a yeah. minute. Um, there are still certain states that still, and I know we keep going back to the same question, but that there are still certain states that still institutionalize. Yeah. Uh, is that ever going to end, do you think, in, in your opinion? Like, will we ever stop institutionalizing people with special needs or putting them in congregate settings? I, so I don't know. There's, I, I do know that, uh, that, as I was saying earlier, when you create a culture of a them instead of a culture of a we, that's where you start having divisiveness. So making sure that everybody still has access to the same level of interaction with the community of their choosing, that's what it comes down to being a part of a being part of a community. Having people freely access gymnasiums and libraries and, and, and malls and stores and school settings, uh, and they still are able to have that same, having everybody have the same access to every part of the community of their choosing is important. Um, the and plus this is what it comes down to. It's actually more cost effective as well for a community, for for a society to make sure that everybody is included in it. You're, we're a richer society for it. We're a stronger society for it when we're able to have multiple backgrounds and life experiences um, and, and, and 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 cognitive abilities all together makes us stronger as a community. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as you start thinking for the sake of safety that, that, that separation is, is important, that's nothing ever good, nothing ever good comes from uh, separating out people. Wait, uh, explain a little bit more about that. Well, if there's, as I say, when you create a culture of them instead of a culture of we, Mm -hmm. Then you have, you create 
uh, you create issues of xenophobia, you create issues of, of prejudice, you create issues of all that stuff. But if we are all interacting with each other on a regular basis and we all have that, that ability to do that, that's mm -hmm. the most important part of what well, makes us What stronger. are some of the other uh, projects that you're working on? I know that you guys merged with the Brain Injury uh, Association, but is there anything else that you're working on right now? I think we're continuing to work on our advocacy piece. We're continuing to do uh, education on what a shared living provider is. Mm -hmm. We're always, always in need for having more shared hey, living providers. So can you explain what a shared living provider is? Yeah, so a shared living provider is somebody who opens up their home, who has been trained by our agency, that has oversight of our agency, who acts as an independent contractor um, that, that, act, that provides a nursing level nursing level care of service and for somebody living with a disability in their own homes. So there's that ability of making sure that their home is accessible, their home is a, that has all the bells and whistles that you would find in a nursing facility, but in the convenience of somebody's own neighborhood among their own friends and family. Is it, so talking about uh, shared living providers, is it difficult sometimes to pair up People with special needs and shared living providers? Yeah, so there's, and that's what it comes down to is like looking at what the best fit is for somebody. And like, keep in mind, we're not talking about the perfect fit, we're talking about the best fit. If somebody says they want to live in a certain town, or they want to live in a certain neighborhood, or they want to um, have access to somebody that goes to the same church as them, or you have somebody that says, I can't be around dogs, or I can't be around smoking, um, it's basically thinking about that from per perspective of a what you're looking for if you're buying your own home or renting your own apartment is you're trying to find the best match. It might not be the perfect match, but we're trying to find the best match for the person to make sure that they are living the life that they need to be living. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, so what are some of the, while we still have some time, left, what are some of the future goals of Green Mountain Support Services? I mean, I just believe it's really important that we continue to advocate and educate people on the, uh, the work we do and making sure that we are also an aging population. Mm -hmm. um, we are needing to make sure that um, housing is extremely important, but really ultimately what Green Mountain Support Services stands for is to make sure that, to be very clear, is that, um, that we ensure that all of our neighbors with disabilities are living in their community. their community of their choosing, and that's what we need to do. If those that choose to um, you know, live in other, you know, in, if they choose to live in a congregate setting or living, um, or living on their own, if they want to live by themselves or live with people that also experience the same levels of disabilities, as long as they're making that own choice, it's not forced upon them off of budget and not forced upon them by um, uh, uh, over, overzealous um, uh, or being pressured into making that decision. Those are the things that we really advocacy, advocately um, it really want to make sure that we are, we're pushing to make sure that it doesn't happen. But that's, like I say, that's what we do. That's what we stand for. Mm -hmm. um, and we truly believe at Green Mountain Support Services that we are stronger. We are a stronger state. R Vermont is much stronger when everybody has the same level of access to everything else that everybody else does. And that doesn't matter if you are living with an intellectual disability age-related disabilities or disabilities based off of a brain injury. Okay. Well, uh, we would like to thank you for joining us on, on this edition of um, Able Dinner on Air. For more information on Green Mountain Support Services and their work, uh, you can go to www.gmssi.org. That number, I mean, that website, once again, is www dot gmssi dot org and for more information on um, Ableton on air you can go to www dot orcamedia dot net that's www dot o r c a m e d i a dot net um, again Arlene is not here today uh, we would like to thank our um, Ableton on air sponsor Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and many others, including the partnership for the Association for the uh, um, for the Association for the Blind Vermont and the Division for the Blind Vermont. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time.
Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.